I'm Dan Reed. I'm a chair of this year's Test of Time Award Committee. The Test of Time Award recognizes an outstanding paper that's deeply influenced the trajectory of high performance computing and has, as the name suggests, stood the test of time. Today, I'm delighted to introduce uh, this year's winner, representing a team of people, uh, uh, David Shaw. David, uh, a little bit of background about David. David received his PhD from Stanford in 1980. And he became a professor at Columbia. Uh, and uh, as he and I were reminiscing, I'm old enough to remember his early work on Nodvon uh, and its application to relational databases. But uh, he left Columbia and started uh, uh, the eponymously named D.E. Shaw, uh, which uh, uh, engaged in, in really uh, fundamental work in, uh, in quantitative trading on the financial markets. David's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he served on the President's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. He's widely known with his team for his work on computational biology, including a series of special purpose machines known as Anton for computational biochemistry. And this is the work for which he and his team are being recognized today. So I'm delighted to recognize David and the team's work with the SC23 Test of Time Award. Please join me in welcoming David Shaw to the stage. Hi there. I think I can tell people are hearing me because I'm hearing myself echo twice. Uh, so um, I wanted to uh, start by giving you sort of an overview of what our research group does. And then since the idea here is to, um, to talk about a paper that has had an impact over the years, um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what some of the guts of the machines that we've designed are. Um, and then talk not just about the whole issue of, um, of what's going on within the supercomputer industry and where we fit into that, but also uh, the applications, because a lot of what's going on over the last, I think it's 13 years now since, uh, yeah, 14 years since uh, SE09, um, has been the applications. Uh, so I'll be uh, showing you some movies, and if I run out of time, I'll just show all of the ones that I've got and stop there. So um, D.E. Shaw Research is, uh, well, let's see if I can make this happen. There's a weirdness in displaying it. Yeah, it's working. Um, we work on a couple things. One of them is developing, designing and developing new kinds of computational technologies um, to understand the behavior of uh, biologically and, and pharmaceutically interesting molecules. And those tend to be um, proteins, sometimes nucleic acids, but fairly big um, uh, systems, which then are biological systems, which when we design drugs, the most common thing historically has been to take small molecules and design them so they interact with those proteins in a way that changes the behavior, um, uh, either you know to understand how it works in the body normally, uh, or in a disease state, or and this is the long-term goal and always has been for us to design new molecules that could serve as medications, which is something that we're finally actually doing um, just the last few years. Uh, the, the kinds of technologies that we use, um, there are a couple now. Um, the main one has been, and the one that's most relevant to uh, what we're all gathered here for, is special purpose supercomputers um, and in this case designed specifically for the application of molecular dynamic simulations. And I'm gonna, since not everybody in the supercomputer audience uh, will be familiar, I'm gonna take you on just a very quick tour of what that kind of uh, application is. So you can see to sort of see what are the time consuming parts, what do you need to speed up, and then what do you get out the other end. Um, so that's been the core technology all along. It still is the thing that's most central to what we do, but like pretty much everybody in every, every industry and area, um, machine learning has also started to have a significant effect uh, within this field. Um, and 
we're especially interested in the, uh, the various kinds of synergies, both complementary and synergistic relationships between, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be saying MD simulations, molecular dynamics of watching the molecules move, um, and the whole area of machine learning. So I'm not gonna spend much time, but I'll be pointing at that a couple times. Okay. So um, just a, another bit about how we're organized, what we are as a group. Um, this is an inherently interdisciplinary effort, uh, and that's because, you know, on the, I mean, I've sometimes flipped the chart, but um, at the top level in terms of, you know, closest to the end user, um, we have a group of drug discovery researchers who are involved in the final stage of understanding the pathology uh, behind a disease and then designing a medication for it. Um, but then a group of uh, scientists, computational chemists and uh, computational biologists who have done the research over the years that underlies a lot of this. And then as we go on, we're very much a research-driven enterprise. So that's a major core thing that allows us to do what we do. And then as we move toward the technology, um, the drawing group circles around is a little difficult, but we have um, a number of computer scientists and applied mathematicians. Uh, and then the underlying thing that runs everything that we do is, uh, is the responsibility uh, and the product of the genius of a group of computer architects and engineers. Um, so let me quickly take you through uh, an empty simulation, um, both to see what it is, but especially to see what's hard about it and what takes so long. So basically when, what you're doing in an empty simulation is um, you have a molecule, let's say a protein, with a lot of atoms in it, and that might be anywhere between tens of thousands and now um, you know, on our most recent Anton, uh, some millions of atoms. Uh, and what you want to see is you're basically integrating Newton's laws of motion to see um, if you start at a certain point and then forces act on the molecule, how does it move over time? How does the shape change? How does it interact with other kind of molecules and so forth? Um, so the problem with this is that in order, you're basically integrating an initial value problem, a partial differential equation that's an initial value problem and you do that by breaking time into little time steps. Um, and it turns out with the, uh, the underlying frequency, the harmonic motions um, of uh, a biological MD simulation, you have to break uh, time up into tiny time steps on the order of a femtosecond, sometimes two femtoseconds if you're really clever. And that results in um, a lot of things, each one of those uh, one femtosecond slices, you have to do a lot of stuff, and that turns into a very computationally uh, demanding problem. So what do you do on every time step? So, well, this is not quite right. Um, it's just a good way to sort of visualize it. Um, think of it as, uh, and this is kind of like what happens with one of the types of forces, electrostatic force, the Coulomb interaction. Um, if you look at all pairs of atoms, let's say within a molecule, you wanna see what the effect of each atom is on each other atom. So it's a quadratic process. You can cheat a little bit and do things at a greater distance without it, and we and everybody in the field do, but this builds up very fast. It builds up as n squared, uh, where n's the number of atoms. And then um, the simple thing that you do after that, although I thought I had, huh, did I eliminate the force field? Yes, so I guess I decided not to go through it in detail. So, so what you're gonna do at the top level is you calculate the forces on every atom and then you move the system, move all of the atoms in that direction um, a little bit, and then you repeat the process, you know, a gazillion times. And in particular, in the sort of period of time that we were most interested in doing um, for the first time, nobody had done it for this long, but um, there was reason to want to do this um, for periods uh, on the order of, say, up to a millisecond or so, or a few milliseconds. And that turns out to be 10 to the 12th time steps. 
Uh, and then each one of those evaluations, I won't go through now what it is, but has several parts to it. Some of them are simple spring motions for covalently bonded uh, atoms. Then there are more distant forces like the electrostatic interactions. Some others that are slightly slightly weirder, um, something called the van der Waals interaction, which is actually uh, a, a pair of different interactions, one of which is you know, full of quantum weirdness and hard to describe even if I had an hour here. Um, but all of those things have to be done for every atom um, with a quadratic number of atoms in every time step. So it takes a really, really long time. Um, now, prior to the completion of Anton 1, which was uh, in, it was presented at SEO 9 and I think uh, became, uh, got up and running in 2008. And before that, the fastest uh, supercomputers in the world had simulated um, about, uh, at a rate of about um, a tenth of a microsecond uh, of simulated time a day, about 100, uh, I don't know. Uh, oh God, I always mix up. I'm just going to leave it the way it was here. Is that number right? Yes, that's right. A tenth of a microsecond per day. And the longest simulation that had ever been done um, was 10 microseconds long. And that was on one of the world's fastest machines and lasted a good deal of time. I can't remember if it was months or, or just weeks, but it was a heroic computation. Um, but the problem was that many of the most important biological uh, phenomena and also the kinds of phenomena that were most relevant to potential pharmaceutical design, um, we had known, uh, sorry, the whole community had known, took place on time scales between 10 microseconds and one millisecond. So you were orders of magnitude, a couple orders of magnitude short of where you had to be. And people had done MD simulations um, and uh, I'll, I'll actually show you a little picture of an empty simulation. And there were interesting changes to watch, but a lot of it was just things vibrating and not showing the big changes that are uh, highly relevant to both biological and pharmaceutical applications. Um, so uh, in 2008, we finished a machine, a machine called Anton-1, uh, and we reported it in uh, the paper, which our group is, you know, uh, been fortunate enough and, and gratified enough to uh, get this prize. Um, and what it did was um, it used um, a highly unusual specialized um, uh, high performance computer that was designed specifically for the MD application, um, massively parallel and using custom designed chips, ASICs, um, and uh, had a lot of specialized hardware for things like. Um, particle interactions, pairwise particle interactions, where I was mentioning two particles, you want to see the forces on each other, um, and, and a variety of other things that are just kind of in the various inner loops for that sort of processing, all put onto silicon in a way that can't do anything else. It's not like we were smarter, knew how to design better supercomputers. It was a very restricted task, um, and it wound up working very well for that. So oh, I want to make sure I keep track of the time. Uh, let's see, when? Dan, do you know when I'm supposed to break? 45 minutes. Okay, and that's uh, starting like 10 minutes ago or something? Okay and you'll yell at me if I go too long. That's good, great, okay, good. Um, so, um, so let's see, uh, yeah, so uh, the test of time paper was published there and um, it allowed a uh, dramatic increase in uh, total simulation length because of its speed um, by about 100, about 100 fold faster and that allowed us for the first time to conduct an MD simulation that was about a millisecond uh, long. Um, and that showed up all sorts of new things. Um, so why was Anton 1 fast? And some of the things are still there, especially the general uh, design philosophy, but we're now on Anton 3, and I'll try and give you sort of a quick Cliff's Notes versions of just uh, a couple of the changes that have gone on over the years and what drives them. 
Um, so there were, I believe I broke it down into three different areas, but one of the most important was um, the co-design of the architecture, uh, the algorithms, and the biophysical models that we were using together. Um, because if we had just taken you know, conventional fast supercomputers, general purpose supercomputers, and run new algorithms on it, we could have gotten some speed up, um, but it really would have been much too slow to get into this sort of uh, time frame. Uh, and conversely, if we took a new type of supercomputer, a new architecture, but ran conventional algorithms on it, again, we could have gotten a significant speed up, but nowhere near two orders of magnitude. So it was thinking of the two together um, and trying to figure out how you could change the nature of the problem in a way that you could design a machine for it with the algorithms and the whole thing would work. Uh, and then the final part was the biological model. So um, <clears throat> there are various ways that you could describe the underlying chemical systems, represent something by point-wise charges, or it can be done with, you know, um, um, multipole expansion with spherical harmonics and various things can be you know, represented all sorts of different ways. If you've got polarizable uh, charges that you're representing, that can be done in different ways. So while we were thinking about uh, what to build uh, and, you know, how to actually use it, what the algorithms would be, we were also thinking about, okay, this wouldn't work very well, but if we model this underlying system and the physics of it in a certain way, then we could build something that would be very fast for it. Um, and uh, in terms of the architecture itself, um, the core thing, you know, as, as always, there's kind of an inner loop, and in this case, um, there's um, the key things that you need to do are highly regular, and that won't be the case for all problems. You couldn't build an Anton for all applications. Sometimes you can prove that you can't go faster than a certain speed, for example, because of inviolable uh, bandwidth or latency considerations. Um, but in this case, um, the, there are some things that get done so, so much. And so um, Anton was designed to, uh, based on the physics of the uh, underlying molecular interactions, um, and the core part of it was very inflexible. It was just a bunch of logic that was really fast really stupid in the sense that, you know, the information all flowed down in a pipeline, no looping, uh, there would be some tables and parameters, uh, but nothing in that part of the system was programmable. That was kind of the core part. Now, we did need flexibility and programmability um, for some kinds of operations, um, but even then, uh, the highest priority was given to, you know, we'll have some stuff that's programmable, but we were brutal to the people who were designing that embedded software and put a high priority on having it run fast, even though it wasn't trivial at all to program. You had to keep track of a highly parallel, a highly horizontal architecture and you know, keep track of what you're doing and then verify it and so forth. So the basic idea was really high density, very dumb processing for wherever you can. Uh, and then for the part where you really can't, having enough flexibility and no more. Um, so this is, I think this actually isn't um, the diagram of what finally got built, but it's, um, it sort of illustrates, uh, oh, I may not have a pointer easily. I'm gonna try, I have to move it to a different screen. No pointer. This is like a video game which accounts for why I can't do it. Well, it's okay. Uh, I'll do it by color. So um, this is one of a number of uh, what we call pairwise point interaction pipelines. So um, they're designed to be highly efficient for interacting to atoms, for example, or in some places for interacting um, an atom with a grid point on a very regular grid. And that's what it can do, and that's all it can do, but really, really fast. Um, the thing to notice here, it wouldn't help that much to point out all of it, but this is one of many that were placed on the chip. And the key thing is, if you see the blue boxes here, um, each blue box um, 
represents some arithmetic going on. And it's structured in a way where the top, oh, a point from here. So um, that those top rows, what they're doing is screening out two particles to get rid of all the ones that are obviously in some sense too distant to do that kind of calculation. And those are little skinny arithmetic units, um, like I think eight bits is what we wound up with, why? Um, and then does a little arithmetic and then concentrates the flow to the ones that now you want to look at more carefully. They go down these various pipelines. Um, there's some lookup tables and so forth. And then at the end of that, what comes out is either the forces on all of the individual atoms or the potential, the potential energy of the whole system, which turns out to be something you use in a variety of ways. So um, it's really fast. I won't talk about the tower and and uh, yeah, uh, there isn't enough on here anyway, but there's a flow of data that comes from outside in a highly regular way. Combining that logic with a whole discipline for the communication resulted in um, a lot of speed, but just for this application, not a super fast supercomputer, really a special purpose device. Um, so that I just alluded to it, but the last uh, component of making it fast was um, communication done in a very disciplined, very particular way <clears throat> at all levels within the machine. So within the chip, um, data flowed, and data still flows in uh, Anton 2 and Anton 3, um, basically whenever possible to exactly when it's needed. It doesn't stop off around the way. It doesn't go into a global memory even on the chip. Um, you see waves of it coming down, and that results in a lot of bandwidth. Um, and then uh, the memory part, there is a fair amount of memory, but it's distributed across the chip. And um, you almost never have to go outside in the course of an MD simulation and access uh, data from memory. You set it up, there are occasional times when you do, <clears throat> but everything is going on in the chip, which is important because going off to memory, as you all know, it can be a very expensive thing. Um, and then at the interchip level, I'm not going to show anything about it, but um, we had some application-specific ways of um, minimizing both the latency and, and the throughput um, of uh, the computations that we needed to do. Uh, and again, we had the luxury of doing that because we knew what, lo what uh, algorithms we were trying to speed up, and we didn't have to worry about the many things you do on a general-purpose supercomputer. So uh, now let me just move on to the succeeding generations. Um, in 2013, um, we uh, deployed Anton 2, and that had a performance that was about an order of magnitude faster than Anton uh, 1. And uh, the ordinary supercomputers had also gotten much faster, both the both Anton's and general purpose supercomputers were about 10 times faster than they had been, and the ratio was about the same. Um, and that continued with Anton 3, which I'll get to uh, in a sec, all in ballpark terms. Um, also with Anton 2, um, the capacity of the system became much larger, capacity being the total number of atoms that we could efficiently handle. Um, that went up by about a factor of 15-fold, which was a critical point at that time uh, because we could do a lot of interesting simulations, um, but uh, to get to a whole class of things that were pharmaceutically important, um, you really had to have bigger systems, and when you move beyond that boundary and had to schlep around tons of information uh, between chips, you lost um, a tremendous amount of the efficiency. Uh, and we also improved on the flexibility and the programmability of the parts of the system that were programmable. Um, still sort of painful to program, um, but what we had learned from seeing what our chemists wanted to do, and also in some cases there were just wish lists that um, members of the team, a number of whom are out here right now, um, had you know said, look, we'd really like this, or the chemists would be telling the architects, if we could do this, this would be terrific. And we were pretty disciplined about saying, you know, if we start doing all of the items here, we'll never actually get to silicon. So we took the most, the ones we thought were most important or suspected were, 
implemented those, and by Anton II, we were able to go down further uh, down the list. And also, our chemists and biologists had more experience now figuring out what they actually used. Um, you know, the core stuff was what we expected, but, you know, different workflows. Oh, you know, this person doesn't run the longest simulation. They run very long simulations, not that long, but they run a hundred of them, and they want the answer back in four hours, you know, rather than four days. Just a bunch of things like that. So we did some, I won't go through the detailed architectural changes. I do, <clears throat> I do want to get to Anton III, the latest generation. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, and the other thing was um, supporting <clears throat> more accurate physical models. They're, they're called force fields. Um, in the world of molecular dynamic simulations. And they're the underlying models of the various um, chemical, uh, chemical interactions um, that are used in MD simulations. So Anton II was able to support a wider variety and some ones that were more accurate. Uh, and then supporting also some new algorithms. <clears throat> Excuse me, I hope I make it through this. Um, I was a little getting a cold. Um, Oh, now let me show you an actual simulation. So this, um, actually what I should do is start it and talk to you then, because I deliberately have made this a very long simulation. So um, the, the, what you're seeing here is a protein. The particular one is not especially significant. Um, <clears throat> it actually is one that we used for our, um, for testing out the hardware uh, when it was ready and used it for getting all sorts of other information. Um, and what you're seeing here is a connected protein where everyone, oh yeah, you can't see that, but every one of those balls is an atom. Uh, the, gray, the darker gray ones are carbons, the white ones are hydrogens, uh, blue is nitrogen and uh, red are oxygen. And what we're really interested in is these big kind of motions, not the tiny, tiny vibrating and stuff. Uh, oh, okay, this one is over. So, um, the, if, um, so this is what it looked like on Anton. We saw a good period of time, and in the real systems we were interested in studying, we were able to see for the first time what really goes on in simulations at this sort of time scale, which is not to say that what happened before wasn't useful. Other people had used MD, but they were looking at much smaller scale localized um, changes. Uh, and we really needed to look at something very different to approach drug discovery in the long run the way we wanted to. So just, uh, I think what you just saw was about 40-ish seconds long uh, in terms of what you saw here. Um, and what you simulate, I guess I pulled off the exact amount of time, but uh, just in terms of how long, how, so uh, in terms of the amount of clock time that was required for the simulation, you just saw something uh, about 40 seconds long. Um, and here's what you would see on the fastest general purpose supercomputer uh, at that same point. Um, in the same amount of clock time. So watch carefully. Just that much. So uh, again, the, the reason you're seeing so little is um, that whole thing is filtered. You've got basically a low pass filter. Otherwise, if you spread it out and looked in detail, you would have seen all sorts of interesting vibrations. For the long Anton simulation, you'd just see a blur because it's uh, so long and so compact. So people were studying real things, but those parts where the whole protein moved into a very different structure, those were key things, and it was important to us and was something that was very interesting to a lot of people within the field to see for the first time. Um, so that brings us to Anton III, that's the most recently deployed machine, which um, the first 512 node machine was deployed um, just last year. Yeah, I guess we we're building small systems um, in the laboratory, but now we're actually using them, using a bunch of Anton III's as part of our workflow, and the workflow has changed very significantly uh, because of a couple of things. One is that um, Anton III is capable of simulating much, much larger biological systems, ones with millions of atoms. Um, and that opens up a whole new set of, uh, of things. For example, simulation of the ribosome, which is a tremendous 
um, assembly, a machine basically of a bunch of proteins and a bunch of nucleic acids and some other random stuff that basically manufactures the proteins in the body based on instructions that go into it in the form of RNA. It's a big classic structure. It's structure won the Nobel Prize. Um, and uh, we wanted to see what was really going on there so we can simulate <clears throat> those kinds of things now that wouldn't have been effective, would have been very inefficient to do on Anton too. Um, and it's also another order of magnitude or so faster than Anton two, so about two orders of magnitude faster than Anton one. Um, again, there's like a two order of magnitude also um, improvement in, uh, yeah, um, uh, in Anton over of the current Anton in each of these generations compared to the current, the then current, uh, fastest general purpose uh, supercomputer. Um, in fact, I think we've gained on that a little bit. Both curves got uh, better <clears throat> uh, and, and it's a little bit better relative to the general purpose approach. Um, this is, uh, it's got a lot of information on it that I won't try and go through, but um, the the x-axis here is the size of the chemical system, that is, like the number of atoms is what's there. And then uh, the simulation speed is on the y-axis and that's measured in microseconds per day. <clears throat> now, um, you see various curves, it's a log scale, um, and you'll see various curves here that show uh, as you go up in system size, you know, their performance goes down, uh, you're simulating more stuff, so that makes sense. And um, there are nodes here that are from Anton 1 and Anton 2 and some other things, or a couple I uh, erased on the slide. Somebody else made it and I just did some things to remove some of the information there. Um, but um, in some of the, uh, the regimes here of chemical system sides that were quite interested in at this point, not the only ones, but that are important. Um, you're seeing uh, an improvement from, uh, from the best conventional supercomputers compared with Anton 3 of, you know, a little more than two orders of magnitude. In the center part, um, you know, close to 500 times faster. Um, and what you're really, uh, you know, comparing here is GPUs, which have gotten very, very fast, not as fast as Anton, or supercomputers, most of which for these kind of applications are based on GPUs and, and CPUs and other things. Um, but it's still a lot faster is what this really shows. Um, so what did we do differently in Anton 3? Well, um, there are a few different things. There are actually several pages and I tried to pull out things that seemed particularly important, so I've just got three here. <clears throat> One of them is to refactor the layout on the, uh, the chip, and let me just backtrack and say what that was uh, in Anton 1 and Anton 2. So, um, the, um, I mentioned the very fast, very dumb computations, I mean, not by dumb people, but things where you can't really program it, but it's blindingly fast. Um, and those were represented by a bunch of little sub-modules. Um, you can think of those as tiles that were all clustered together. And then separately, there was a part of the ship that had a bunch of flexible subsystems that could, um, within limits, you know, they were quite fast for, you know, something that was, and very ingenious for, um, you know, I didn't do any of it so I can say that, uh, for that kind of flexible computation. Um, but uh, they're important also, and they lived in a separate sort of subcomponent on the chip. Now, in Anton 3, um, that was changed around, so now what we have is one, it's not literally, but one type of tile that represents both of those functions put together to form, you know, a larger tile. And then, uh, so, you know, the flexible and uh, particle-particle interaction part are close to each other and then there are lots of them. And, you know, partly that's a reflection of the fact that over time technology involved so that some things got a lot faster and power lower and various other things, but some things relative to those uh, became the real bottleneck. So, you know, we're really finding that communicating 
end to end across the chip was slowing things down greatly and so you wound up wasting some of the speed and refactoring it so that you had these together had several advantages and flexibility, but that's one of the, one of the things that it allowed. It was a response to changes in the underlying uh, process uh, technology and system organizations. Um, then, uh, oh, another one is we introduced another sort of special, a little special purpose module to speed up things that we found we were spending a lot of time on. And we had thought about this in, for a while and, and the group came up with some things that um, have worked very well. And those are bond calculators. Um, the, if you look at that force field, um, usually broken down into three, um, three categories of interactions between covalently bonded uh, atoms and then two that are between distant ones, ones that are non-covalently bonded. Um, so the part that is um, those bonded interactions where you're looking at uh, things that are attached to each other and propagate, you know, what turns into vibrations and so forth, um, we found that we were able to save area, uh, save energy, get more speed by uh, introducing a new kind of specialized, new chunk of specialized hardware and taking loads off other parts of the chip. Uh, so that also helped its uh, performance. Um, and then uh, this is, there were several other things and honestly I kind of ran out uh, of space on the slide and decided I didn't want too many slides. So I stopped at three, but they're particularly important ones. Um, the last one was to reduce the amount of inner chip communication load um, by using various data compression techniques, and we'd always done data compression, but by looking at um, what we actually did a lot of um, uh, and also thinking about how underlying technology, technological changes had made the, made the communication between chips increasingly important, increasingly the bottleneck, uh, so that you really couldn't use a lot of the processing power on the chip. Uh, but we'd also learned a lot about the nature of the things we were calculating and started looking in great detail at, um, well, what do we know about the underlying physics that could help us find redundancy, um, do various kinds of standard data compression, but a bunch of things that applied because we know so much about what kind of data is sent. So again, this is the sort of thing that isn't, that part isn't a contribution across all of the fields that use supercomputers, but allows us to um, make our Anton machines much faster because we have the luxury of looking at one particular application. Uh, so let me just move on now to um, the impact. This is oriented toward which, um, uh, which papers had an Im a lasting impact and um, in various areas. Um, some of it, uh, I won't spend much time on it, but you know, um, it was very pleasing to us that people were interested in the supercomputing community and the kind of approaches we used. Historically, it had been very hard to have special purpose machines compete with general purpose machines. You know, you'd have something where people worked like crazy, got a five-fold speed up, um, and then ordinary technology accelerated so fast that, um, or maybe they had tenfold and it was reduced to threefold and it was hard to find a market, whether it's literally that or, or users who could use that. Um, and it was great that Anton actually got a factor of 100 for this particular application that was exciting to us. But the part that's, um, that really relates to our long-term goal more was um, to do the underlying science, learn stuff about these molecular systems, and then ultimately to cure some people. That's what we always wanted to do. Um, so let me start with the research part. Right after the, the uh, right after SEO9, where we rep uh, reported on um, the architecture and some initial results and so forth of Anton One, um, we published a paper the next year in the journal Science that reported on things that we'd done on Anton One. Um, and that were, they were accomplished, what, what we were able to learn was things that required a couple of magnet, orders of magnitude of additional speed. Um, and 
you know, people have been working in protein, protein systems and motion and physiology. Um, I had several of them come up to me after we presented uh, in talks what we've done, and some of the world's great ones said, look, I know more, they knew much more than I did about each of those systems, but they said, I know about some of these changes from all this evidence, but you know, looking at the movie, seeing those kind of changes, it was sort of like, that's what a protein is. You know, like that's what it's doing. And it, it does seem like the visceral feeling for it, just what it looks like, that is worth something, at least to somebody like me who doesn't have a tremendous background in the physical chemistry or the molecular level biology. Um, then, uh, but also this first paper that we published, which was in Science, um, <clears throat> it did two things. One is it introduced the first millisecond long simulation, which was dramatically longer than what had happened before, um, and was able to gather some uh, clues, gather some data about what do proteins do? How do they move? What time scales? Um, what are the linkages? And then also a particular uh, problem that had been of interest to the field for a long time, which is, it's, this is very, very confusing, um, was often referred to as the grand challenge problem of protein folding, the protein folding problem, which is as used over the years, really means two completely different um, uh, problems. One was to understand the process of protein folding, um, and then the second one was to predict the structures of proteins based on just the amino acid sequences, because uh, it was discovered many decades ago that you know the code, the genetic code, uniquely determines um, the three-dimensional structure of proteins, and there, in most cases, you could just squirt you know these polypeptide chains into a petri dish or test tube or whatever they use, um, and it would fold up into the right uh, the right shapes. So understanding that process was important. Um, and then uh, what's happened much more recently, um, turns out actually one of the, oh, it's on the next slide, I guess. Uh, yeah, you'll notice that the protein folding piece, um, one of the authors is John Jumper. Um, and for those of you who know about this area, John um, was, he w was working in our lab, then went out to finish his PhD, and then later become the head of the AlphaFold proje uh, project, which has been able to predict for the first time the structure of a large fraction of all proteins um, using machine learning techniques. Um, and that's a different problem. That's something we never tried to do. Um, we were doing a different, we wanted to see the dynamics and see what was going on. But um, the, the paper made a real impact, both in terms of understanding how proteins move and also protein folding in particular, which does was in large part um, an example, because it's involved in certain diseases, but that's not why we were really interested in it. Um, and between the two of those things, the, um, the paper in science received an enormous amount of attention. Um, it became the most cited uh, paper in the field of chemistry um, for a two-month two period in the summer of 2011. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's when it would be. Um, and also science, science did a thing where um, at the end of the year they would list um, their judgment of the 10 most important scientific breakthroughs of the year, and they listed Anton as one of the, Anton and the uh, discoveries that were made uh, using it um, as one of the 10. So uh, let me just quickly, I'm not gonna, I don't really have time to show much about any of these, but I'll just show you one picture of, um, you know, I think it was really the first protein that we saw fold. Um, and uh, let's see, I think the gray part, this is actually two copies um, of um, the, um, you know, of the protein that we're seeing fold. The gray part, oops, you, don't have a, you don't have a cursor, but the gray part here is the static known structure which had already been determined for this fairly small protein. And then the part that's in, it varies from one end to another, but the sort of yellowish to orangish part, um, that's kind of move around. So we started with it in an unfolded uh, form and you're seeing it go around and search for its correct structure. And um, 
there were a lot of hypotheses and, in fact, deadly battles between two camps who had different approaches, um, you know, different hypotheses about how protein folding actually worked. And this helped to answer some of those questions. And you see it actually folded up into um, essentially exactly the same, the correct shape. So uh, it was an uncomfortable period there where, you know, we got calls from different people who were on the different combatants in that basic battle. Um, and it didn't fully resolve it, but provided a lot of the information that people were interested in seeing. Um, now I'm just going to show you and move into the, the last part of all this, which is drug discovery. So let me just show you one simulation that was done on, uh, on a protein uh, that's uh, called the sarcinase that actually is implicated in cancer in a form of, uh, a form of leukemia. Um, and there's a drug that's an approved drug that's been used for the treatment of uh, this kind of leukemia. Um, and what you'll see in this is the process by which that drug finds a location where it's going to bind. These drugs, you know, have their effect. They're targeted, uh, they're referred to generally as targeted medications. Um, they bind to a particular part of the protein, which is in gray. Um, the molecule is the drug-like molecule, actually the drug is hiding in the back. And it's a very simple kind of simulation where you release it in a box of water, water and a little bit of salt, and you see whether it can find where it's supposed to go. So it turns out, it figures out pretty quickly that it should be somewhere right next to the protein, which wasn't obvious to us. It searches around, and in a kind of systematic way, it often has sort of a landing pad that's not quite right, but it's in the right area. And what you see here it turns out to be almost exactly the correct structure that was known experimentally for how that drug binds to sarcinase. And in fact, it's a better fit than it looks like because we don't show the water molecules or you wouldn't be able to see the protein. And when you look at those little gaps around the compound, uh, that's filled with what are called structural waters, waters that sort of stay there and play a key role in the binding. Um, and we have a bunch of things that were done like that. Um, but I'm not going to show other examples. I want to show you something that it's a similar kind of simulation, but this is trying to find a target on a protein. Very often, um, scientists will know that, um, that you know, a, particular, um, a particular protein uh, is the, has been mutated, for example, and is causing a disease. Um, <clears throat> but they don't know if they're designing molecules that try and bind to it in the same way as we saw in the last simulation. They don't know where on the protein it binds, much less what the con three-dimensional configuration is of the binding. So this is an example where we were trying to find that out for um, a uh, phosphatase, SHIP2. Um, and we're going to start by just looking, this is kind of part of a workflow, looking at the surface of this while it moves. And experimentally, you can't find anything that looks like a pocket. There are usually indentations, crevices, or sometimes tubes. And in our simulation, we could see things that lasted for only a very short period of time, which you couldn't see experimentally. If you look down there, you're seeing a hole, and that starts to look like a potential place that a drug could fit in. And I won't explain all of this, but here it's sort of mapping out um, the, uh, the chemical properties of different parts of uh, the inside of this putative cavity. And this looks like one big thing, but it's actually glommed together a whole bunch of small fragments that, again, are used to probe it and give us ideas for what's going on, how something might bind. And then when you look at a molecule, a single molecule, which might turn into a drug, um, and here is one, uh, sure enough, this thing binds to this pocket, which is not visible. It wasn't suspected that it was actually there. Uh, we found it by simulation, and that's part of our workflow now, is we will sometimes, not always, um, try to find a potential binding pocket that is cryptic or cryptic or ephemeral, something that um, you can't see on the protein, 
and you couldn't see experimentally, but very quickly it'll open up and then close up again. So we can see that um, in many cases and then design drugs to fit those. Um, and I just want to show you a couple other examples from um, for the drug discovery applications. So this is another example where we're finding uh, binding pockets, places where a drug could bind, um, a different kind of representation of the protein, and we're going to see a whole bunch of potential compounds, uh, actually in this case mostly fragments, things that aren't as big as a typical drug molecule, and they're going to swim around um, looking for potential places to bind, <clears throat> and then when something binds a lot there, um, that it's sort of graphically illustrated so we can see it. It turns yellow, or when there's something that's really attaching, it turns red. And this molecule, and if it weren't competing, you would see other ones do it uh, as well, highlights a part, the part that's in red, that might be a good target for uh, drug discovery. Uh, I'll just show you one other of these. Um, this is one where early in the COVID uh, epidemic, pand well, before it was called a pandemic, you know, in uh, very early, um, yeah, late, uh, no, I guess mostly early 2020 at that point, um, we and a lot of people in the field sort of dropped what we were doing, not everything, but, and, collaborated, worked independently, exchanged MD simulations, all agreed we're not going to, we're going to exchange all the data we've got with each other and all the clues we have before we publish that we really wanted to do it that way. Oh, oh am I over already? I am, yeah, okay, let me do that quickly. I'm very close to the end, though. Um, so I'll just show you the movie. But this is looking down on the famous spike protein, which is actually three identical copies of the same protein. And this is one that, like Paxlovid, um, which wasn't available here, um, the goal was to find something that could interact with it in a way that would um, close up this spike so it couldn't inject um, viral RNA and cause trick the host cells into uh, producing and replicating the virus. And here's a detailed thing where there are various interactions that help us understand it. This one did not work, um, but uh, you know we sort of passed on what we had. Um, and yeah, all I wanted to do now is just sort of give you a list. Um, we now have um, six drugs in clinical trials in humans after years of working on it. Very gratifying to see real human beings taking them. Two were developed uh, independently by our lab all the way from the science up to um, running clinical trials in humans. And then four others uh, we developed collaboratively with Relay Therapeutics, which is um, a group that we were co-founders of and other co-founders were experimentalists and various pharmaceutical, people with pharmaceutical expertise. Um, the company focuses on protein dynamics and I won't go through what they all are, but all of these four drugs are for cancer. Um, one is uh, cholangiocarcinoma, which is a fairly rare uh, cancer of the bile duct, and then breast cancer and various other solid tumors, um, and one of them has now been uh, licensed to Genentech. And then for our own um, independent ones, we have two drugs out there. Um, one is a, an extremely selective blocker of an ion channel. It's basically a tube going through um, the cell or the, a cell membrane, uh, and if you block it, you can um, cut off some sorts of interactions that could cause disease, but most of the things you use to do that also block a bunch of other ion channels, and the patient gets really sick. So we had very specific ones uh, that just hit our target protein, and um, turns out in mice we found out that it was active against models of ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and um, the most common form of eczema. And we completed successful phase one clinical trials in humans uh, in early last year and licensed it to Eli Lilly, which is furiously developing it as a drug. And then the final one is um, one that we went into clinical trials on 
very recently, also an ion channel where the targeted uh, application is various forms of pain and also several inflammatory and respiratory diseases. So the, uh, it was just in July we went into clinical trials. David, we're going to have to reset the room here for a, a subsequent session. Yeah, and the, the, all, all I was going to show you is this, which I can skip. Uh, uh, Okay, uh, yeah, we probably don't have time for questions. No, we don't. I apologize to whoever. Let, let, we will have an opportunity to recognize David and the team at the, uh, the award session on Thursday. Please join me in thanking David uh, for this test of time presentation. We'll take care of it. All right, thank you all.